Here's what I wanted to talk about this morning. Uh, a few basic definitions, uh, and uh, a once over lightly on how we measure aircraft noise, and then uh, focusing on annoyance as a measure of community response to uh, aircraft noise exposure, and then some observations about how hard it is to do epidemiological research on uh, aircraft noise effects. So let's start off with some basic definitions. The usual definition of noise is unwanted sound. That's awfully elliptical because it leaves out the part about it's uh, noise, sound that someone else considers uh, too inconvenient to control. And inconvenient can mean anything from uh, cost too much to do it or it's uh, too inefficient. Uh, if we had quiet airplanes, uh, none of us could afford the uh, tickets to Los Angeles and back uh, because they would be little tiny airplanes with small engines. And uh, in general, economists consider noise a negative externality in the sense that it's not priced into what you're paying for the airplane ticket. And the people who subsidize the rest of it are those typically who live near uh, communities, near airports. And then we get to the question, the related question of, uh, well, why do we bother measuring aircraft noise in the first place? And most people think, well, because it's there to be measured. But if it actually didn't annoy people and interfere with their sleep and disturb their speech, uh, very few people would consider it worthwhile to uh, bother measuring it. It follows from that that any measure of noise that doesn't support some sort of understanding or prediction of community response is uh, of very little interest, and there are plenty of them. <laughs> there are as many ways to measure noise as there are purposes for making the measurement, and a lot of the metrics have very little to do with community response. So how do we actually measure the noise? Well, we can uh, actually go out and uh, uh, put out a microphone somewhere and make a spot measurement for a short period of time. Or we could spend a lot of money and continuously monitor it at a lot of places all around the community on a permanent basis. Or we can just model it with all sorts of software that has been developed over the last 30 or 40 years where you uh, create a house of cards of assumptions uh, about how many airplanes operate at what time of day from which runways, going how far, carrying how much fuel, uh, and uh, you, could, you, know, you can do it that way too, and you end up with garbage in, garbage out, more often than not. The reason it's hard to measure aircraft noise in a succinct and meaningful way, the reason that there's such an alphabet soup of aircraft noise measurements is that uh, it's a very complicated matter. It, it varies all the time. On a typical flyover, both the amplitude and the frequency vary uh, at various points in the overflight. They vary by the type of airplane and how the runways are being used, with the weather from day to day, from place to place. And they vary over an enormous range uh, of about 12 orders of magnitude. And because that range is so enormous, 10 to the 12 is about 100. Thousand billion, big number, and uh, it's very hard to express on a, uh, a linear scale, and that pushes us to, toward logarithmic scales. That I'll address in just a minute, and then there's the time scales of interest. Are you interested in what's happening right now, uh, or on a hypothetical average annual day? The contours that you were shown earlier were uh, an average annual day. That's not anybody's exposure in any real 24-hour time period. It's a hypothetical construct. Uh, if we took the noise exposure on each of 365 days and somehow picked a typical day when the average fleet was operating in the average uh, mode of the airport, going to the average number of destinations, carrying the average numbers of passengers, that's what those contours that you saw earlier for Logan were. So let's uh, get over the hard part, uh, decibels. Um, it's the reasons that acousticians are still with us, because they know how to spell decibel, and uh, many people uh, have a hard time with it. I should say that in about half a century of talking to juries and teaching courses at Berkeley and other places, I have never succeeded in explaining what a decibel is <laughs> to, to people. Um, and the, the funny part is that it's a ratio scale. It's not a linear scale. It's not like a tape measure where the inch 
from one inches to two inches is the same inch as the one from a thousand inches to a thousand and one inches. It's a ratio scale. So on a scale like that, uh, the distance from one unit to ten units is the same everywhere along the scale, whether we're talking about the difference from one thousand to ten thousand or from, uh, you know, point one to one, you know, that's <laughs> the ratios. All acousticians think in terms of ratios all the time. They never think about absolute units. And the reason they do that is because it compresses the, you know, the, the, the enormous range that you have to deal with. You know, if you're talking about numbers that are varying by 12 orders of magnitude, you just have to deal with ratios. Um, and here's what we're talking about. The difference from a penny to a dime is the same as from, uh, you know, a hundred bucks to a thousand bucks. That's just a weird way to measure. <laughs> you don't measure money that way. <laughs> but we do as acousticians do it, and it gets us into all kinds of trouble. And you know, most obviously, uh, you can't do simple arithmetic. <laughs> So 60 dB plus 60 dB is only 63 dB, it's not 120. And 70 dB and 70 and 70 and 70, well that's just 76 dB, it's not, uh, you know, a, a gazillion dB. And that's because we have to, uh, you know, it's just four times, you don't add the exponents, right? And 60 dB and 90 dB, you know, like adding one more plane to a bunch of others, and that's 90 dB and a taste. And that's because uh, a million and a billion isn't that much more than a billion. Yeah? <laughs> and once again, I've had the same luck that I've had for the last 50 years in, in trying to get these uh, concepts across. But, uh, you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, <laughs> I've been proven wrong once again. I keep thinking that one day I'll be able to get through. People are, uh, an another one of these uh, complexities is that it's not as though people are perfectly able to hear sounds of all frequencies equally well. And it's even more complicated than that because even though you can't hear the low frequencies, your house can. Uh, and, you know, it can rattle and wiggle and create nonlinear effects that you you think you might hear an airplane going by, but your window just feels like rattling anyway. Um, and in general, people are uh, most sensitive to noises in the speech range, which is not terribly surprising, considering that we evolved, you know, the ears and the, and the vocal tract uh, evolved together. Uh, and uh, this problem was first confronted in the late 1920s, not long after it became possible to make measurements. Uh, you know, at the end of World this is a digression. At the end of World War I, tube amplifiers became available, and very shortly thereafter, uh, these waiting networks were developed. And the, the first urban noise survey was done in 1929 by Bell Laboratories, and New York City wanted to know how loud is New York City. And the good engineers at Bell said, well, what kind of noise? You know, all the noise that there is or just the parts you can hear? <laughs> and uh, it became immediately obvious once you asked the question that if your purpose in making the noise measurements is to reflect their effects on people, then you don't want to measure all the noise that's being produced, but only the parts that uh, affect people most heavily. So let's look at the temporal variability here. If you put a microphone at a point on the ground and wait for an airplane to fly over it, you get this typical haystack pattern. Um, you know, here, here comes the airplane, now it's right past directly overhead and then it flies away. And what part of that is the measurement that you would like to represent? You know, is it the peak? Is it the integrated energy under the curve? Is it the duration? Is it the number of such events? You know, which, which one is the best measure? Well, best measure is a funny term. Uh, the numerically largest one is sometimes the maximum A-weighted sound level. Uh, that reflects, however, only a moment in time at the very peak, and it doesn't take into account the number or the duration of aircraft overflights. So if all you're looking for is a big number, well, you can measure the, the max. Um, but of course, you know, the, 
the absolute magnitude is of not much interest if you're trying to predict, uh, in general, the effect on communities. Uh, if you're looking for an even bigger number, we could do a little mathematical trickery, and we could take the sound exposure level, which uh, first takes all the energy under the curve, that's all the noise that's emitted by the aircraft, but then because the durations of different flyovers are different, you need to normalize that to something if you want to compare a loud, slow airplane with a noisy, fast airplane. Uh, why not normalize them both to one second? And so it's sort of a, a legal fiction that all of the noise during the flyover occurred during one second, and the math is easy enough, uh, but you end up with this funny situation where you take the entire duration and you shrink it down and pretend that it was all in one second. And then you can go one step further and you can add all those up for a day and get to uh, an equivalent sound level. Uh, or, if you wanted to, you could impose a, an arbitrary 10 dB penalty for nighttime operations. And then you could express everything as a 24-hour A-weighted, time-weighted uh, noise exposure level. Uh, where you separate nighttime, daytime, or in California, evening time, into different categories, and then you sum them all up logarithmically, <laughs> and then uh, it's this, you end up with this, this, again, another hypothetical construct that nobody understands. You know, it's, and you can't directly experience it. If I were to nail your shoes to the floor and make you stand there for 24 hours, at the end of 24 hours to say, I just heard the day-night average sound level. But it is a much maligned metric. It makes a lot of sense to acousticians, but not to other people. People widely misconstrue the fact that it's got the word average in it. The average comes from the normalization. There are 86,400 seconds in a day, 24 times 24 times 60, and 10 times the log of uh, 86,400 happens to be 49.4 dB, and so if we take the sound exposure level and subtract 49.4 dB, <laughs> of all the events that occurred during the day, we would come up with a day-night average sound level. Every drop of energy, of, of acoustic energy, is represented in that number, but because people see the word average in the uh, title, they say, oh, well, that's not sensitive to the maximum noise level today. You know, that's just the average, and you know, that's just not the case. But, uh, and, and then the other problem, of course, is that any unpopular uh, regulatory interpretation expressed in units of decibels would attract the same adverse uh, and poor understanding from a community. Uh, but uh, day net average sound level is, when you, the, the public most often sees day night average sound level as a series of contours drawn around runways. And uh, it's, it's a shoot the messenger problem. No, you know, it wouldn't matter what you called it, nobody wants to uh, take those as representative of noise exposure. But that 10 dB nighttime penalty leads to this situation where one airplane at 9.59 p.m. is worth 10 airplanes at 10.01 p.m., which can lead to bunching of flights at aircraft, you know, to avoid those higher noise penalties at 9.59 p.m. Everyone's trying to get on the ground quickly before 10 o'clock and then at 10.01. If you hadn't done that, you would have incurred a 10 dB penalty in order of magnitude. And there are a lot of other issues too. Uh, not to mention that <laughs> the uh, nighttime correction is entirely arbitrary. The, you, you have to make these expedient sorts of decisions to come up with simple regulations and then everybody criticizes them. So where did, how did, how did we fall into this pigsty? <laughs> where, how did we get to <laughs> this terrible situation? And the answer is you can trace pretty carefully back to the late 1940s, early 1950s when military jets started operating and the immediate concern was these, uh, you know, the, these aircraft spouses may not want to live in base housing anymore and then we can't recruit young Lieutenant Smith to fly airplanes for us because there's no place to house his family. And so the primary interest at the time was in complaints and speech interference, maybe a little bit of sleep interference, but annoyance had nothing to do with it back in the 1950s. Um, you know, 
real men didn't worry about annoyance, but sleep disturbance and speech interference was a more obvious problem. And then there, the alphabet soup started about then. Uh, the initial uh, publication in 1953 by Stevens and Rosenblith and the staff of BBN was a community noise rating, a CNR, and being acousticians, they of course put it in decibel-like units. And so from the very outset, nobody understood what it was about. I should point out that you can also um, take these log units and convert them back into uh, Pascal squared seconds, but that doesn't do, <laughs> do you much good. <laughs> and, you know, at least they're on a linear scale. But then you'd say, well, that uh, yesterday's noise exposure was 498,226.3 Pascal squared seconds. And uh, you know, some people find it easier to say 60 dB, even if they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and then the community noise rating, when it was replaced by a noise exposure forecast in uh, the 1960s, continued to evolve. And then through some legislative uh, magic in 1979, the Aircraft Safety and Noise Act compelled FAA to you know, cut it out with all this you know, all these different measurement scales, just pick one, you know, and it, it was like King Canute trying to tell the tide not to come in. Congress told FAA, pick one unit and stick with it, and it's, you know, it's just as it was beyond King Canute's ability to stop the tide from coming in, Congress did not have the ability to create a simple dosage response relationship that accounted for most of the variance in a relationship, and FAA couldn't devise it either, but they tried. And uh, the other reason that FAA didn't like DNL, this is long ago history, was that it wasn't invented here. It came from <laughs> California. <laughs> and uh, you know what California's problem is. Um, the odd thing is that throughout all of this, from uh, CNR through NEF through DNL, the criteria for the significance of noise exposure didn't change. Uh, and Worse yet, the significance of noise exposure expressed, is expressed in decibels, which is just a direct confusion of cause and effect. It's like saying, uh, you know how effective this vaccine is? We gave 100,000 doses of it. <laughs> yeah, and what about the incidence of disease? Oh, you know, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> and you, you know, the, um, in Japanese pre-scientific society, the uh, explanation for earthquakes is, well, the earth is balanced on the back of a turtle, and um, when the turtle moves, the earth shakes. Uh, and uh, a seismologist interviewing a nice old Japanese peasant lady, I, you know, anecdotally, says, well, if the world is supported on the back of the turtle, what's the turtle standing on? And she says, another turtle? And he said, yes, but what's the other turtle standing on? And she says, don't be impertinent, young man. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and that's basically where we are still today uh, because the criteria haven't changed. And if you think about it, the original CNR rating back in the 1950s was almost exclusively based on complaints and threats of litigation. It wasn't trying to establish a pleasant environment for people. It was just how do we suppress the complaints and keep people living in base housing. The lowest turtle in this stack is standing on some informal opinions of World War II era acousticians, many of them here from Boston, uh, during the early days of the Cold War, about 65 years ago, about the acceptability of military aircraft noise exposure. Interestingly, FAA was given a completely schizophrenic charter when it was founded in 1958, part of the charter was to uh, for safeguard, you know, safe and efficient national air transportation network, and that's motherhood and apple pie. Everybody applauds that, but because the aircraft industry <coughs> had a lot of influential lobbyists and was used to being coddled ever since airmail contracts in the 1920s, um, FAA's other charter was to promote civil aviation. Congress took that charter away in 1996, and FAA is no longer supposed to be promoting civil aviation, <coughs> but nobody at FAA seems to have noticed. So here's, here's where the situation stands. Uh, 
We have a rather mechanistic approach to uh, analyzing individual responses to aircraft noise. The last thing that acousticians can measure is the sound intensity as it strikes the ear, you know, the tympanic membrane. And beyond that, everything is frightfully complex. It occurs in warm, dark biological fluids. It can't be directly observed. It can't be measured with a microphone. And so if you want to know how annoyed people are, the easiest thing to do is to assume they have a little sound level meter inside their head and they look at the needle to see if they're annoyed. A bit of an oversimplification, but not a lot. <laughs> and then uh, Ted Schultz came along in 1976. He had a contract with Housing and Urban Development to help them figure out where they should lend money for uh, housing. And he published it in 1978 in the Journal of the Acoustical Society. And it was a very influential paper. He took a fragmented world literature and translated all the Swedish and German and French and Italian studies into English. And he compared the questionnaires. He converted the alphabet soup of noise metrics into day-night average sound level. And um, by 1985, uh, only seven years later, uh, moving at warp speed, FAA, uh, said, yeah, Schultz got it straight. It's the percent of the population that is consequentially annoyed, not just a little bit annoyed. You know, a lot of things annoy people, potholes in the street, crime, schools, you know, all that stuff. But I mean, really annoyed. If you're measuring annoyance through the questionnaire and you ask people, are you not at all slightly, moderately, very, or extremely annoyed? If you just look at the ones who say very and extremely annoyed, that's the population proportion that's consequentially annoyed by aircraft noise. He didn't want to trivialize the concept of annoyance, which of course had been a pattern for the previous 30 years. And then in 1992, uh, a collection of federal agencies, uh, self-appointed, no congressional charter, uh, sort of akin to a committee of foxes discussing the lock on the hen house door, decided <laughs> that uh, the uh, Schultz curve is the, uh, is the way to go, and they were willing to update it. When Ted Schultz uh, came up with a relationship in 1976, he only had 161 data points. I put together another 292 from the world literature, came to about 490-some data points, and um, they used a linear regression to, uh, no, it wasn't linear, it was uh, a, uh, it's a logarithmic one, but anyway, <laughs> it was univariate. <clears throat> and um, th the notion was that, well, just like individuals, communities have some sort of dosage response relationship. You take all that noise exposure on the left from all those different sources and you run it through everybody's ears and then magic happens. Uh, there's some sort of transfer function. They actually specified what the transfer function was in 1992 and then collectively say, people say, we're highly annoyed. Um, and it's univariate logistic regression. Univariate regression means whatever you plot on the, on the abscissa is responsible for whatever happens on the ordinate. And nothing else, just that, that's all. Uh, so that's the mechanistic approach.